Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Ann Ackerson, serving as COSA's Communication and Development Coordinator, and I'm delighted to see you here today um, for the second installment of our two-part Cultural Competency Workshop with Helen Wongsmith. And before I turn it over to her, I guess maybe I don't have any other I guess maybe I don't have any other announcements. <laughs> Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Helen, who I know has uh, really put some additional thinking into tying remarks, her remarks today, to uh, electronic records um, management and digital preservation issues. So, Helen. Okay, mahalo, Lan. Okay, so what I'm going to do is share my screen. And once again, I'm going to ask all of you to tell me if I have it um, on the right view. Okay, so are you seeing only my screen with scenario or are you seeing my next slide? Next slide. Let's all right, it. so I can always, there we go. Okay. Wait. How many of you, and I'm going to ask you to put your cameras on for this first part, um, how many of you were able to look, uh, watch this scenario, and I'd like to open it up to open discussion of uh, the different things that we learned last week as far as um, the skills, um, and what was, um, what did you notice was being um, applied toward the goal of cultural competency, and even talk about the um, the examples of incompetence. <laughs> I like to so on. go ahead. What did you think about the um, director comment about their they're the experts? She she didn't seem to want to reach out to the community at all. She blamed it on the community that there was no conversation. Right. Um, and just sort of dismissed it. Yeah. Which I found very aggravating. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully all of you found that aggravating too. So, okay. Um, and then, you know, she was dismissive. And then on top of that, um, we put in that thing is like, well, it's, you know, we're the experts, right? You know, when they were, they were told that they put uh, something, um, displayed it incorrectly. And so we hoped that you would be as, as offended of that as, as we were. Um, so that's a very thank you, Lizette, because that's um, something that we wanted to show that, that people may have the best of intentions, um, but, you know, we hold the collection you know, and we know about it. So that's an, that's one thing. What's another example of, um, did, what did you think of when Kai um, suggested to the junior archivist, Sam, uh, what did we call her, assistant archivist, um, that she go out to the community? Would you have found that off-putting if somebody had recommended that to you? So I think for me, uh, I had suspicions that Kai was likely a member of the community, but with the assistant not really knowing that, I may have wondered if it was appropriate to show up to a community experience uninvited. Mm. Um, if I had known that Kai was a member of the community inviting me to this space, I would have eagerly accepted the invitation, but I probably would have had a little concern just showing up, um, knowing that we didn't have an established relationship with this group mm -hmm. um, and would have maybe sought an invitation or verified it was okay to be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point, Joy. You know, I don't think that we had thought about that when we wrote this. Um, we did it because we felt it was a public space, you know, it was at a park. And um, we, you know, the fact that he knew where it was, 
you know, we, we thought that that was enough to show that there was a um, connection to the community, but you're right, we didn't, um, we didn't want to make it obvious that Kai was part of that community as well. Good point, though. Um, so I'm not saying that as long as it's a public space, you have the right to walt waltz in there. But it was it was um, more of a th type of thing that if there's a, a festival of some type, you know, to to expose yourself to that. Thank you very much, Joy. What did you think about? Um, we included the fact, you know, when the member of the community comes in and talks to Sam in the second half, you notice that she said, um, "I've been hearing a lot of good things that you've." you've been doing, you know, working with our youth group or something like that. What did you feel, what did you get from that? Did you feel that that was, um, uh, what was the purpose of us putting that in there? Well, I'll tell you, so uh, that that was done so that we are saying you're not going out to community say come here tell us about your culture tell us what we want to know to improve our stuff you are giving you are providing a resource or knowledge to them now you know of course this was a short scenario we had to squeeze it all in but my experience has been that um you need to give to the community first so what i've done um, when I realized that certain cultures were being marginalized from collections or repositories, is that I re I con considered what is it that piques their interest? You know, what in our collection could help them that they may not know about or may not know how to navigate? And this is going to be very important when you design your digital platforms and you have all your digital um digital objects out there and how they're going to search for them. So this is something that I um, made sure that the, it showed that the archivist was giving to the community. Um, what I've done is I've said, okay, this is how you conduct genealogical research in, in um, our collection. And so, or this is how you conduct land transactions because there's these funky things the way the, the state government changed from this year to this year, this new rule, you know, this new um, HRS chain, oh, excuse me, Hawaii revised statutes, not the same for you, TRS. Um, so, <laughs> you know, this is what changed. And so now from this, this year on, um, you would have to look up land this way, you know, just some kind of short um, um, layman's term type of presentation to give the the cultures or the communities something um, as well. So the purpose of this was to show you also the fact that we use a, a paraprofessional in the organization was to reflect that you may not know everything about your subordinates or everybody in your, in your workforce and the resources that they have. Now you notice that Kai had been there for a long time, probably longer than anybody else that was in the, in the scenario. And he chose not to speak out. Even when the director said, right, Kai, he just kind of shrugged like, and he'd have had it. You know, he had had it. He thought, okay, they don't recognize my, my role in this community. I'm not gonna say anything when they display something incorrectly. Um, it's not my place. I'm just trying to keep my job. Okay. So she, Sam had to really work at realizing or, or finding out and then engaging Kai's support. So even when she asked him directly, and that's the thing, often in cultures, in certain cultures, you say, hey, I asked him, he didn't tell me, what the heck? What else am I supposed to do? And I've dealt with that in organizations as well. Say, so, hey, we came to the person and we said, you have a problem with this new organizational structure and they didn't say anything. So, and, and yet they're moping around, what am I supposed to do? But you know, everybody's gonna have a different way of expressing their dissatisfaction, having their opinions heard, whatever. So 
even though she asked him point black, what was the first thing he said? Well, there's a brochure over there. Okay, so this is the kind of stuff that I encourage you to realize that everybody has different knowledge bases and the more diverse your workforce is, the more diverse, and, and remember, I'm not talking about just ethnicity, the, but the life experiences, um, then you'll have these different um, experiences, point, point of views, networks from each one, and then they can, they can help you in, in all facets of, of archival um, tasks and responsibilities. So I hope you, um, as we go along, you get more out of that scenario, but I won't beat a dead horse yet. Um, so often you need to frame the situation. And so consider prior events. And so that includes learn and many, you know, on many times we move from one repository or to the other, or even if you stay at the same repository for a while, don't forget prior events. If you are you're new there, learn about prior events. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, did they have um, this conflict between a particular culture or community with how things were being displayed or how people were treated because memories in certain cultures run long. They're not like us, we're, we're so busy, we're just rushing to the next project and trying to get things done communities, especially when they are there, they have long memories. Like the example that I shared last week with um, my father saying that Filipinos prefer working with Chinese because of the war. And they don't want to work with Japanese um, insurance people. So, you know, prior events weigh heavily in how you um, inter interact with different cultures. And then consider the nature of the relationship. Remember, in many cultures, if you're not an equal, you're going to be, they're going to act differently to you. So Kai was not going to tell the director or even the assistant archivist that, you know, well, this happened and, um, you know, they were, they were shot down or they were treated rudely and, you know, um, it's not my place. He's not going to, he's not going to verbalize all that. You have to be aware, observation, all of that. And then consider um, the topic under discussion. If it's a topic, if you're working with a culture that knows more about the topic than you do, oh, please um, let, them do, let them lead the, the conversation. And location, 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 just like real estate. But sometimes it it's behooves you to go out, if not out to them, get a, uh, get a neutral area, okay? Expecting them to you come into the state archives is um, not always the best thing. If you want to show them what you have, you can do that. But I have seen some of the best interactions where the archivist scans some of the documents they have from their collection, goes out into to meet the culture, and whips out their laptop and says, look, I got this, I got this, look at this photo, look at this document. And they were just like, wow, so cool. But that's because they were not told, you must come into my office, you must come into state archives and, and do this, so, uh, and review this. So this is the type of stuff that I encourage you to um, consider. Part of framing the situation is to remain, remember the attributions. So, Making attributions um, is this process that, you know, it, it, it comes, it's innate almost, you know, for all of us. We were so accustomed to um, see somebody or the way they act or the way they dress or what have you. And based on your own history with that particular culture or community, you make an attribution. And so this is something that's very difficult to catch yourself, but I encourage you to keep that in your mind. So how do you do that? Well, you monitor your own attitude and your own mood. So um, consider the sophisticated stereos, that's what they are, okay? And then, so if you follow these, um, these parts of making attributions, 
um, these steps, then you might be able to um, catch yourself and go, okay, yeah, I'm thinking about that other person from this community and they were very, um, they had a chip on their shoulder. So not everybody from this community is gonna have a chip on their shoulder when I'm trying to share or explain something to them or ask them something. So these are the types of things. Um, a guidebook will large it will warn you against large scale standardization um, interventions. And this is, I totally agree with this. I've seen this like, oh, we did this with this culture. So we're gonna do this um, with this culture. Okay, or this community. And so standardized interventions work extremely well for a small segment of a, of a particular culture, um, but it produces mediocre results for a large segment. So, and it extremely bad results for another small segment. So what you have learned working with this particular culture, wonderful. You can, if that was successful, utilize the steps that you have learned However, be ready to pivot because what is applicable for this community might not be as effective for another community. So interventions need to be based not on a client's or a patron's cultural group, but rather on the nature of the individual patron whose individuality is part, a partly a manifestation of his or her culture. Um, so this is something that, you know, you, you, you come with some knowledge base, you listen, you definitely do active listening. You definitely um, um, create uh, openness so that they can, you, you have the openness so that you don't just bombard them with information of, of all about your collection and what you can do for them, but listen. And then um, be aware, like you noticed in the scenario, um, Sam was able to finally recognize that when two people from the same culture greeted each other, they had the secret handshake, right? And so we purposely put that in there so that she was then realizing that, okay, this is an appropriate way to show respect to Kai, okay? And so, and people always ask, ask me, oh, isn't that cultural appropriation? It's with the intent that you do it. Okay, so I am not offended when people say, um, use a Hawaiian word when I greet them with aloha and they respond with aloha. I don't consider that cultural appropriation. They're, they're respecting my culture. I said it to them. But if they go around saying, oh, this, this is my favorite at a, a, cra at a craft fair or a farmer's market, you know, that somebody who's slapped a Hawaiian name on something and they go, oh, this is going to, this is an ancient, um, um, royal treatment. It's like, no, you're not, no, you're not. You don't know what you're talking about. So, so don't, don't tell cultures about the importance of certain things in your collections is what I'm going to say. Um, so how would you consider how you would employ these different frameworks that I just showed you um, dealing with with a conflict? So there are two different ways of, of going about that. Um, and we can use this for the opportunities for reparative descriptions. Um, so an example is, um, and, and you'll have these um, links when you, um, we'll, we'll put them in the, um, in the follow-up information. But um, the 2015 CFW Coker Award from Yale was Yale's Reparative Archival Description Working Group. And so I encourage you to take a look at that. and We'll give you the link. And then NARA, NARA has guidance on um, um, reparative and then how to deal recommendations from an internal task force on racism. And then even Executive Order 13985 from 2021, uh, from the feds has advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities throughout the federal governments. I encourage you to take a look, excuse me, take a look at these resources because you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you also don't have to follow everything to the T because you are working with different communities than they are. But there's no reason that you can't call what is appropriate. So you, you, 
don't look at one of these resources and say, okay, we're going to duplicate that and make it fit for our, our state. No, you learn about the cultures and your communities in your state. Then you look at these guidelines and um, um, working groups, and then you pull out what is appropriate for yours. And you do that through the ethnography of communication, learning about um, having that knowledge, um, and practicing that whole the whole framework of ethno ethnography communication. So that ethnography is on the personal side, and then and of course you know sense making is on the personal side. But then you take that all of these these um, approaches that are listed here, and then you can follow one of these um, frameworks or guidance documents, and then use it for your own. So I hope that that makes sense to you. So let's talk about organization-wide. Most of my talk, my, my workshops are all about the interpersonal. That's very nice. I mean, it's necessary, but how are you going to let it expand to the organization? Well, there's two different ways. Um, an appropriate opportunity is to create a reparative description team. And so, you know, those are, are things that can be done. Um, maintain cultural awareness, including um, gender issues. I would also add ageism issues um, at all levels of the organization. And then recruit culturally diverse employees. And this is something that I mentioned before is that career de professional development should be available to all employees, not just your professional staff. Even if you can't afford to send them somewhere or pay for it, at least give them the administrative time to attend something. Um, if they say, oh, this particular group invited me to come to their, um, their meeting, let the person go. Let them be that be part of their job because they're going to make a network of uh, they're going to make connections that are going to help. It will help you. Um, somebody asked me yesterday on um, uh, what I liked because I've worked in so many different organizations, federal, state, nonprofit, um, academic, and she said, "Well, what is it that you?" Dis, you know, dislike and like and all this kind of stuff. And I said, I think what concerns me is that somebody had asked me, can I speak about my new book and um, in your, at your archives? And I was like, oh yeah, that's great. You know, history, you know, archival primary resources were used. And I was told, unless they used our collection, resources from our collection for that book, it's not appropriate. And I beg to differ. I think the more people that you open up to and allow these types of things, if you have talks, if you open up for talks about different cultures that may or may not be representative, of course, you know, prefer they are represented in your collection, but you may not always know. You may not know how these records that you hold impact these other cultures and communities. So I encourage you to be open to those types of things and, and support and facilitate those types of um, talks because you don't know every aspect of your own collection. You don't know all of the different uses that they can, they can uh, possess and somebody else may find a use um, or a treasure trove in your collections that you would have never thought of. So what I encourage you to is to, um, and monitor this change plan when, you know, cause you gotta, you gotta be answerable like to whoever, like, why are you going through this? Why are you letting this person off to go in this? Go ahead and, and, and monitor those changes. So um, let me go here, there we go. And then for external, um, strategies. I would encourage you to um, establish culture comp competent relationships with different communities and organizations. So they can be civic clubs, they can be um, churches, even because in many um, or, um, communities, the church is the, the, 
the structure for um, community activi um, activity and um, communication within the different cultures. And then um, review the ethics and social responsibility of the organization. And, you know, we don't, you don't have a lot to say because you're a state entity, you know, you have to abide by um, what the state or, you know, whether it's secretary of state, you fall under the secretary of state's office or whoever, um, or the library, um, but make sure that you look at your ethics and social responsibility. And if it's lacking, make the suggestion that you maybe want to improve incorporate that into your responsibility because that's going to give you the the way the methodology of well, methodology but the um the venue the the excuse to <laughs> reach out to these different cultures so um the other thing is strive for patron satisfaction in culturally relevant ways this is something that too often I see archives thinking, client satisfaction, did you, you know, the typical Likert scale or the um, 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 survey form and so on. Maybe that's not their way of expressing their satisfaction or dissatisfaction. You might have to have a coffee hour. You might have to have a... Um, an open house, and you may have to ha employ a lot more people to have um, informal conversations. So these are the way. Think of different ways because we're so you know we're 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 trained professionally to to behave a certain way, and unfortunately because our profession is so Western based, and we are so accustomed, we're programmed to to extract information in only limited amounts of ways, but consider, and the more you expose yourself to other cultures, go out and seek different cultures and different communities than you're accustomed to or that you're comfortable with, then you, you can and observe, then you can see how do people exchange their satisfaction or dissatisfaction. Do they go straight up to the manager and say, I demand satisfaction now? Probably not. Do they go back to their group and say, wah, 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 you know, and then we should do something about it. Okay, no, yes, no, yeah, but you know, but there's different ways that people do it. So this is something that I want you to be concerned about. So when I say employed cultural diversity, competence in service delivery, that was like what I mentioned. Um, the, um, did I mention about my NARA experience in this work for this group? Ashley, yes, no. Did I talk about NARA, but taking the Hawaiian translators to mm -hmm. NARA? Okay, this is a good one. So I took a group of Hawaiian translators to um, NARA 2. And um, first of all, for many of them, it was the first time they ever saw snow. Okay, so we are just like freezing, right? We're islanders. We don't know how to handle this cold weather. And then when we get in the reading room, we they work collaboratively. You know, so they're all, it's not like your normal reading room where everybody's at their own desks, not with their blinders on. They work. And then one of the girls kicked off her boots because now she's indoors and she's not cold anymore. So she kicks off her boots under the table. And one of the staff members comes running up and says, whose boots are those? And she, oh, it's, it's mine. He goes, keep your footwear on. Well, first of all, in Hawaii, we don't usually wear footwear. Okay. We're in sandals or slippers, which you call flip-flops. And second of all, his attitude toward her. Like, ooh. and they all looked at me like, Helen, what kind of place did you bring us to? This is very, he was rude. Was it, was it, am I, are the documents going to be um, compromised because of my foot odor? I mean, what is it, you know? So those are the kinds of things that I encourage you. Like, I think I might have mentioned before, um, places for service animals to relieve themselves. You know, those are different cultures that, and communities that I encourage you to think about. So um, always, 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 always. We love our anthropologists and so on, but 
go to an insider's perspective on a particular group. You can start off by reading somebody's um, work about a particular culture. That's not the end point. Just because you read an academic paper or you read somebody's column about a particular culture or community does not end there. That's just to, that's somebody's perspective. And this is something that we were um, talking about recently is that somebody flies in and um, here, right? You gotta fly in. And they um, have a particular subject and they look at a few archival collections and then they fly off and they write their paper. And we were like, how did that person base this paper on one week or two weeks in, in our archival collections when they didn't look at the state archives, they didn't look at this archives, they didn't look at this. And that's the same thing with learning about a culture is that you're, there's always going to be learning and I'm not going to, I would prefer that you go straight to the primary resources, you go straight to the cult, a person from that particular culture, same way. So it's not open to interpretation or a limited view. So one example, um, it's highly doubtful that any of you have records in your collection that are not in English. How, I mean, does anybody have records in their collections that are not in English? Go ahead, I can't see everybody, so just don't raise your hand, speak up, say yes or no, or what are they? Yes. What kind of records yes. are they, Karen? In Alaska, we have records uh, in Russian. We also have records in Clinkett, yet written in Cyrillic. Okay. Uh, we might have a few records uh, from other native organization languages, but primarily and, Clinkett or Russian. And how do you process those? With a, do you have people that know <laughs> those languages? We used to have an archivist from Russia, and I believe she had done some translations. We also have, uh, we work closely with our uh, native Clinkett organizations. But when we, of <laughs> the few documents we have, we have worked with Russian translators or with our University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, the, the Russian students up there. Okay, terrific. So, oh, Barbara, that, yeah, New York. And then Beth, of course, you have Spanish documents. So, you know, this is the funny thing is that um, Hawaii was in the 1800s was one of the most literate countries in the world. I think it was Hawaii had a 93% literacy rate along with Scotland at that time. And that was because the, the royalty recognized that, okay, we're an old tradition. If we want to be players and then on the global scene, we have to become literate. So it was demanded that everyone's going to become, learn how to read and write. And they did prolifically. There were so many Hawaiian language newspapers, but for the past 150 years, history has been written by, Hawaiian history has been written by those who didn't read Hawaiian. They read, they only read English, maybe Latin, okay? And so you have uh, several generations of resources that are based on one facet. So are you getting an insider's perspective on their culture? No, but we're, what are we following generations later? We're, we're looking at. So I encourage you to the same way that you wanna get speakers of your non-English records, preferably somebody who understands the culture and not just the language and the significance of it, then, um, and especially Karen, if you got other um, Native American or, I mean, you know, it's not First Nations. They're not First Nations there, are they? Are they considered First Nations? No, we're not. No, we're no. All, the Alaska Natives, and I think okay. there's only one group of, of Alaskan Indians. Okay, so, you know, if you don't, so when I went to the Library of Congress with this group of translators, I said, okay, I want to look for everything that's Hawaiian. Do you know how many times the Library of Congress um, had unknown 
and I was looking at it and went, oh, okay, this is, I mean, so I have to look at unknown because they don't even know Hawaiian. So, and then I would find things and, okay, this is not Hawaiian, this is Tahitian, or this is not Tahitian, this is, or not Hawaiian, this is Samoan, or, you know, th those kinds of things. So you want to, the same way in order to, to figure out what it is you have, you want to go to someone from that particular culture. So let's go over a couple of examples. So um, um, mentoring and coaching and um, identification. Um, let me close this. I can't even see my own screen. OK, um, provide mentoring and coaching in the identification of cultural diversity issues. Um, you can do this for your staff. If you don't feel comfortable within your own staff, then talk to other state units and how they've done it. Talk to your social um, workers. Talk to how do they, you know, because cultural competency started off in the medical and social fields, social work fields, kind of branched out to coaching. Then it went to the business because, God, you've got to offend people in the business world, right? Got to learn their culture so you can be effective. And so, Take advantage of all that experience that they have. How did they go about um, learning other cultures? Um, so, and create um, groups. And so that's why the survey talked about all these different ways that you can learn from other um, state entities or other people and then um, about how they deal with culturally diverse client base, patron bases. And then um, do you informally or formally have a, a venue for your own staff to talk about it? Um, in the library world, you have these apps that, or you know, you say, okay, this is how I answer this reference question. Um, you can do the same thing that, okay, in the archives is that, okay, these are certain things that somebody asked out of this um, record group and never thought of that before, but just to let you know, this helped them in this way. And other people from that culture may find the same thing of use. Um, the culturally sensitive social events um, and celebrations of ethnic culture is just so trite, but it, it does recognize. And that's why I encourage you not just to recognize days of Con the, con the, the conquerors winning, to put it in a very blunt way, but to, to also, also recognize events in other cultures that might be um, put the state archives in, or the state or the, the federal government in a, in a poor light, but recognize it because then people will say, holy moly, these guys are not afraid to share what they have. And they acknowledge this hurt that we've gone through, or they're acknowledging um, this wrongdoing. So these are uh, things that I encourage you to consider. Um, have diversity planning um, and implementation committee at all different levels. You know, I'm really big on the, on the mixing of paraprofessionals and staff along with professionals. Um, as you can tell, because you need those other voices. You need all voices. So this is from a very um, personal and, and, and um, print-based example. But what I want to talk about a little bit more are the digital aspects, because this is what the, the grant is all about. And too often people think how we want to put things up on a digital platform or present it digitally will be understandable to all. And that's not necessarily true. The same way you do in a personal um, interaction is even more difficult on a digital platform because a person can so easily walk away. It's a little harder to walk away from somebody when you're engaging with them face to face. But on a digital platform, if you don't present things or, uh, or show cultural sensitivity or cultural competence, they'll just say, okay, this is not for me. And you're, they're out of there in nanoseconds. 
So this is one of the um, one of the readings that talks about determinants, and this is actually in the digital um, realm as well. So you have to consider um, determinants, the historical determinants. So in many places, the militarization of your state. I mean, definitely, that's a huge topic in some of our states. Uh, the colonization, depopulations of certain um, communities. So, you know, from my limited view, all I think about when I think of depopulation is like Detroit. You know, you always hear about the mass exodus out of Detroit and what that did to the the communities and how that broke apart the communities. And so think about those determinants. And then um, the socio, these other parts as well. So this is materials, that, these are facets that you can consider that when you are designing any kind of delivery system, think about this as well, these different um, oh, facets, determinants. So when they talk about a digital divide, we often think about um, the who has access. That's all we think about. Who has access to computers? Oh, they don't have access. Oh, okay, they can go to their um, community or they can go to public library. Or we have a couple of we have a couple of um, workstations in the reading room of our archives, so that's good enough. Okay, um, but they often talk about access. And then what you need to think about are those with competencies and skills to benefit from a computer at, um, format from those without. So I spent a lot of time working with my 83 year old mother about uh, you know, building her skills on how to look for things online. So consider that as well. And then this is the part that we come in is the inability to access contextualized content. Too often, we just throw everything up there and it's like a Google search. It's just, you type in a term and way too much comes out. There's no contextualized contextualization. So this is what I encourage you to consider when you're building your digital um, platforms. And so there are these context disparities within um, especially two and three is the qualitative, the ease of use and privacy. Consider that a lot of people may not want to use these, um, the, have the access, uh, have privacy when they're ac accessing the, the works. So vital statistics, um, divorce, you know, I mean, um, court proceedings, dealing with divorce or adoption or things like that. And some of them, it's it's the first time they've seen a record um, showing that who they thought was their father is not their father because they found the birth certificate and the real the biological father's name is there. You know, all these different things. And so much of it is the perception of the user. Do they feel that this digital platform is a welcoming space? So I thought this was pretty interesting um, that the digital, I'm going to say digital age, um, is just as exclusionary as, as anything else, as it was pre-digital. And so um, they often say digital natives, you know, younger generations, because they grew up with it, um, are hardwired to think about um, the technological perspective, but that's not always true. I mean, yeah, the digital natives have grown up with it, they're accustomed to it, but think about your, your patrons who are not digital natives. So what many um, organizations are, cons are adopting is what they call frugal. Um, so frugal is something that it has all these different um, components that you could consider, um, but you focus on the user. And that often requires a lot of navigation hints. It will require a lot of um, um, 
um, help screens or videos or, you know, try to think as many different ways as you can of helping the user. And then Frugal talks about ex expect that some people don't have bandwidth that can download or view those videos. So the Hula Preservation Society here, um, they've been in existence now for 20 years, and they wanted to dispel the uh, exoticism of Hula. You know, that's that was the sexy portrayal and all this kind of stuff. And they want to show that it's a cultural um, uh, cornerstone that has literature and all these different facets that you know the Western uh, media doesn't consider. And so they did a lot of oral history interviews with the elders and they were so excited like okay we're going to put up these videos. Well they were told don't we don't want to see the videos our computers and our lines can't handle them and they just stall. They um, um, they we have to stop and start all over again. It doesn't buffer. You know, I mean, those things occur today. So you know what? Just give us the transcriptions because they're in a Word document and we can, or a PDF, we can see those. So here we are sometimes going, oh, newest and brightest, oh, this is great, you know, but consider your, the variety, the diversity of your users as well. So these are some of the facets of Fugo Innovations. And then uh, consider also how many people are now using them on their phones. So not everybody is sitting in front of a workstation, but also consider the uh, different platforms that are out there that are being used more and more. So you may need to have a, um, um, a survey of the not just a survey of your current users, but learn about the different cultures and communities out there. So what, how you do that, you got to learn use of local resources, um, you know, sourcing without importing equipment or, or materials. These are all these different facets that you can look at um, on your own. But I just wanted to introduce you to the idea of frugal um, innovations. Contextualization. So the way that you have been trained to describe something is maybe very different. And especially if you didn't grow up in the, that particular culture or the community um, or the mul multiple cultures and communities that are now being um, coming into your state should be considered. So just to give you an example, for many years, the Library of Congress um, subject heading, it was the annexation of Hawaii. And it took many years for us to convince them to add the subject heading, the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. If you don't have that subject heading, you don't acknowledge it, right? Oh, Hawaii was happy to be annexed. No, they weren't. So if you add and then the vernacular used by those cultures. Now we're all, we all love our controlled vocabulary, but there's no reason that you can't have local subject headings and they can be controlled as well, but learn the local vernacular. Um, learn not, not just the public patrons, but also the government and local support institutions. What are their needs? So when I was with the State Historic Preservation Division, um, their way of describing or arranging the digital resources was all by tax map key. Well, that's, that's very problematic because tax map keys can change with the evolution of, of the land, the development, or can be further subdivided. Or, but then the way people were asking for them was by place name or by military installation. So you have to consider these might require different indexing terms so that different, the, the um, local government might want to re, um, retrieve these records this way or uh, 
communities, cultures may want to retrieve it by this um, traditional place name. All of these different things can be added to contextualize your collections. Um, consider, of course, um, bandwidth and download speeds. And so the other thing is that users direct, let the users direct involvement in culturally and, and ethnographically informed design. So you don't decide because you don't know what they know. They may find a particular term that you use offensive. So these are the things that I would encourage you to go straight to the EMEC, right? Go straight to the a member of that particular culture. And um, if you can find people that, like Karen, you have translators from the university, right? You know, but if you have somebody from that particular area or that particular culture or that community, ask them, don't just translate things for you but also ask them, is this how people from your community would look for it? How would they look for it? What terms would they use? You know, those are the types of things that I encourage you to investigate as well. So, sorry to tell you, <laughs> but there, this takes a lot of engagement. Um, we overemphasize the role of income and overlook the importance of social and cultural dynamics when it talks about digital. And when I say um, income, it's, you know, like who, who can afford a, com a computer? That's what we're always talking. Well, who, well, how many, we do surveys that say, um, um, oh, X amount of people have a computer in their home. And you've seen those surveys, you know, and so they figured, okay, well, X amount. So, oh, we got to get more computers into the home or things like that. But we, we, we don't consider the social and cultural dynamics that structure participation, um, or inclusion or exclusion. Um, so many times local face-to-face -face, um, instruction or telling people about it has such social capital um, because through that you can offer advice, you can encourage, you can um, provide practical support. So an example is a friend of mine um, started this, this I don't know what you call it, a drive, but a project that Hawaiian language newspapers are, the TypeScript is so old that OCR, it, first of all, OCR is going to call every word a mistake, right? Because it doesn't recognize Hawaiian language. Even if you got a Hawaiian language uh, uh, app, you know, or something that could, I want to say API, but that's not right. But if you found an app that could understand the Hawaiian language. It has evolved so much that from when these um, newspapers were um, printed and they went all the way from the 1820s to 1960s. Okay, so the language itself has evolved as, as any other language has evolved. So between the TypeScript being too fuzzy and too archaic, they said, you know what? We're not even gonna OCR, we're going to have people key it in. Now, you don't have to know Hawaiian. You don't have to read Hawaiian or understand it in order to sit there and type it in, key, key it in. So they started a movement that anybody could get online and they would be given a, a page of text, the, the PDF or TIFF or what have you of the page and then key it in. Okay, and this went on for a couple of years. And his, his response was phenomenal. I can't give you the stats right now. I should give it, I should get it next time I give this workshop. But he went to every island. He flew to every island and would go to all these different events, every festival, every um, and not just to Hawaiian, because he said, you don't have to be Hawaiian. He's white. He's from Michigan. So, um, but he went out to every community and explained it to people. And I could not believe it. When we, when he came to my home, to where I live, my husband signed up. And I thought, you are never going to do this. 
I'm going to do it, which is fine. But he just that social interaction got someone like my husband, who couldn't care less about archives um, and preserving history, um, to, to sign up. So don't underestimate the localized face-to-face -face, um, and the social capital that can, can come from it. So these are the stages of um, digital divide. And IC, ICT stands for Information and Commun Communication Technology, right? Because so much of it is, is the technology. So the elements that need to be taken into consideration and the factors that make up the digital divide are shown as a progression here from formal theoretical access to effective and perceived access. If followed by basic ICT, uh, which they may or may not um, lead to a meaningful in engagement. So the, the text that I have here on the bottom in italics, they have decided that this is basically why people access digital resources. And so it can be to increase their productivity. It can be for a political reason. It can be for all these different things. Um, and so, you know, let's say for um, social activity, they want to show that their particular community um, had this social infrastructure and what happened to it? You know, was, was it a state mandate that they had to disband or like in Hawaii, you know, um, Jap during, after December 7th, Japanese schools were closed, um, Japanese churches, the, the reverends were shipped off to Arkansas or, or, you know, Utah or something like that in re-internment, in internment camps. And so, um, these they've decided that these are different things and then even production i would i would say things like um land you know land claims and things like that that are going to be part of production because they're producing um their own assets or trying to de reconstruct assets so these are the reasons and so if there isn't uh, a meaningful use a meaningful way of navigating your digital resources um, then they're going to, it's not going to be useful. Uh, it's not, it's not significant to them and it has to show that relevance for the patron. So consider that um, maintenance of forms of computer use would depend a large part on access to users who can, uh, who can offer advice and support. So when users are isolated or marginalized from the such networks, they may find it difficult to acquire the competencies to keep using it. So you go through a lot of effort to create your digital platforms. You don't want them just to be sitting there. You want them to be useful to the widest range of people. I think we often think, we, we like to brag, I got X amount of pages digitized and uploaded. And that is a very dangerous place to end, okay? The number of items, the number of records that I digitize, woo woo, look at us, okay? No, also consider how are they being engaged with? If they're just sitting there, uh, it, it doesn't do anybody. You just spend a lot of money and a lot of time on this effort that is not as useful as it could be because you ignored all these different um, aspects of engagement. So what consider all of these um, questions, what types of access to the technologies do people have at home or at work or in the community settings? I, there is a wonderful resource uh, from the survey division here and we have survey, we have maps from the kingdom, okay? Some of the earliest maps, it's fabulous. And how do, you, and it has a nice little portal that you type in the register map number. How do you find which register map number you want? You have to download a PDF, which is, has not even been OCR'd 
or even do it the way my friend with the newspaper said, have somebody key it in if that's what it takes. You have to download the PDF, go through which island is it, which area, which district is it, well, oh, okay, here's the register map number. Now I can go back to the portal and punch in that register map number. So you see the disconnect and many people don't realize that they go, how do I know what register map number I'm looking for? Um, so these are different things um, that not everybody has the, the there's no, um, what do you call, instruction. There's no instruction to tell a person that this is what they need to go through. There's no um, guidance. There's no interaction with communities or even a tutorial, nothing like that. Um, so what are the, what? Do I have the same thing twice? Good heavens, please pardon me. I have the same bullet twice. Um, what is, um, what are the circumstances that they would find to make your resources meaningful. Um, so what are the factors that will, pe will allow or encourage people to con continue using your resources? So these are the, some of the things that I want you to consider when creating your digital platforms. Um, how are their engagements? Um, how does it impact their participation in society? And I would actually encourage you, you know, sometimes we we're so busy producing, processing, producing, getting things up online that we forget how is this going to impact different cultures and different communities. And unless we take the time to ask them, we'll never know. But that's going to be so powerful when you ask for the next big chunk of money or, or when something happens that you don't have community buy-in with, um, with your state patrons. And if it, even if it's another um, state department, um, how did you service them? How did you make your resources, avail resources available to them? All of these things have a huge impact on um, of the support that you're gonna get. Are you just working alone, doing your own thing? And if they can't find it, that's their problem? Or are you going out of your way to find out what are their needs? How are they going to access them? Is there a way that you can tweak your delivery so that it makes it easier on them? So um, these are the some of the things that I want you to consider. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, I'm not throwing shade on anybody here. I'm just giving you some examples of how um, the different levels of engagement can go. So this is, granted, this is beta, okay? But I want you to take a look at, when you look at this screen, it's very pleasing, okay? Big graphic. But the only place I can search, and if you scroll down this screen, the only place I can search is this little tiny bar up in the top right corner. Well, it almost looks like it's part of your, your regular browser bar. You know, its placement is so high and so small that I kept going, where's my, where, where do I search? Where do I search? And then I realized, oh, it's way up here. Okay. And so by typing in something here, it's the same thing like a Google search, way too much. There are no filters. I can't say I only want land documents or I only want photographs or I only want records from this particular office. You know, there's nothing like that. So although it's visually pleasing, it does not encourage continued engagement because it is, um, unless you're a native, a digital native, um, you just get pages and pages of results, okay? So that's one example. Another example is very much like, um, it's a research guide, it's a lib guide, but at least they're telling you getting started, okay? And then they break up the um, um, different resources. 
So do you wanna look only at vital statistics? Do you wanna look at land records and so on? So this has a little more guidance. And so if you're not a digital native, or even if you are, at least you have um, some places that you can be directed to. And then a, taking it a step even further to for cultural and community engagement, is my friend who did all of the newspapers. And what they did is that they had some of the people who actually translated, these are true translators, who have knowledge of the culture and the impact that these records have on the culture, make these little comments. And you can do the same thing. You can have, you can have a space for users to say, I found this in this record group, or I found this on this digital platform, and I was able to do this with it, and this helped me do that. So it's not just um, for your staff to say, hey, maybe we should be aware that this particular record group holds this kind of information that can be applicable for this. Um, but it also tells other users that this is what they, um, this is the significance of this particular um, item. So I would encourage you to take a look at, um, just consider different ways. So I'm gonna give you a five minute comfort break. Let's see, it's seven after, let's come back at quarter after, and then I will just go over a few case studies. Before, before we go, does anyone have any questions about what I've covered? Well, why don't we take the comfort break and at quarter after you can say why you're taking it and you go, what the hell does she mean by that? Okay, so we'll see you at a quarter after. Becky, Thank I don't, you. We're Thank not you. actually discussing anything yet. We just sort of got in the, the, the break started off on a tangent. No, but you know, this is all very pr um, practical. You know, that's the thing. That's what you're dealing with, Ashley. And I'm sure that everybody else is dealing with these types of things. And um, a couple of, you know, I mentioned traditional knowledge and then Mukutu. So it's, it's, it's interesting because different um, collections and different, uh, I don't know how many of you, what percentage of your collections are restricted. And if you're going to digitize that with the, um, um, intention of making them, you know, hitting the button and say, okay, now they're public access or what have you, you know, but that's the, that's the thing behind Mukutu is that I'm working with one group that has burial records. records. They have gone around the, the world and repatriated bones from different museums and bringing them back to Hawaii. And so their records um, some of them we don't want, it, it, it's going to have these different levels that Mukutu allows that only family members can see the location of the burial, okay, or only, um, um, or these are public documents or what have you. So I'm not quite sure how um, all of your collections are going to be, um, what the restrictions may or may not be. And then when it comes to um, cult certain cultures, they may have to be restricted, even though they're digitized and on your public platform. So whereas another group, they're all public records. And so I, I'm not, I'm going to utilize traditional knowledge um, labels, but I'm not going to enforce, or there's no need to enforce the restrictions, you know, but knowing the traditional knowledge, and there's going to be so many different terms actually as you're talking about because this is um, basing um, the colonization of little Pacific islands after the war so um, you know you've got the federal government records you've got the um, state of what well, at the time the territory of Hawaii and then you've got the the Hawaiian um, terms for all these the same areas so this is the kind of stuff that um, I, I totally understand what you're coming from. You got so many different terms because you got so many different cultures and communities. So that's what it, it comes down to. But the thing is that if you don't go through this work and you only describe it by the traditional 
way that the state archives has always done, then you are not keeping up with society and your usage, the engagement is not going to be as robust as it could be. Well, so, and it's, like you were saying, it's all about access. If you don't describe communities in the way in which they're looking for themselves, how can you be <laughs> surprised when they can't find themselves even in content that you already have that is about them? Um, one of our challenges is because of um, the way indigenous people were recorded historically. Um, unless you know the names of families, mm -hmm. you may not know that this particular record isn't about an indigenous person mm -hmm. because with um, the history of the South, you, race will be identified if someone is white and if they're black, mm -hmm. but there's not necessarily an indication of race anywhere else. So mm -hmm. really it's context clues, knowing the histories of the communities, knowing the folks in them. Mm -hmm. So that's a different level of, if, if you're trying to, one of the things we're looking at is trying to provide greater access. Sorry, mm -hmm. did I just take over this meeting to <laughs> talk about North Carolina? One of the things we want to do is not just look at description, but also provide greater access to things that have been buried previously. So and in order to- Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so sorry because all those things, you know, I felt bad about giving you that laundry list of all these different things for the frugal and everything, but that's what it is. It's increasing right. access, you know? Um, so, you know, people forget about that. So the access is indexing, you know, how you describe things. And then all of those other considerations too, that knowledge base. And so that's what drove me crazy when I was with the National Park is that people come in, right? Because they just go spend a couple of years at this park and this park. And so by describing the, uh, the archival collections, they don't have the knowledge of those families. They don't have the knowledge of certain things in our history, the events in our history that is, were pivotal. Um, so they, they're not gonna describe them. You know, to them, it's like, yeah, they can, they can go through a, a processing a collection so fast because they're just looking at things that face, face what they see without that knowledge. And so that's what would frustrate me is that they would, it's, it's not interchangeable. You have to know the cultures, you have to know the communities, um, you have to know the, the players uh, uh, and who, who brought what or who, and, and not always the rich and famous, you know, sometimes those not rich and famous people were very integral in activities that occurred in your state. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ashley, but this is when you said that I went, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, the downside, and, and, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the downside because for so many years, we've looked at trying to provide online access to as much as possible. So mm -hmm. we've given really minimal description to things outside of a few, you know, index terms. And but yeah, yeah. And what's but, what saddens me, it's, it's even worse than ML, M, MPLP in the sense that we think that if we OCR everything, everything's is is, is going to be re retrievable. And you know, and so what do we, re you know, we turn out with way too much. And I do a whole, um, pr I, I do a whole talk on why we need standards and why um, certain um, digital bases uh, platforms, you know. The, that just rely on OCR are not <laughs> very useful to us. So. Well, and you talked about context um, and mm -hmm. so many of us use tools we don't create. So we're mm -hmm. buying tools from some other institution. Let's say, let's pick on OCLC because Continuum is so widely used. Mm -hmm. So we, the things that we actually have control of as far as our presentation are relatively small. We can. What are, what are we titling and what are we grouping in a collection? Mm -hmm. How are we describing those items? And what are we putting in the collections themselves? Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking about, navigating some of these systems is definitely not something you wake up one day and just know. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, you, you, even people who are digital natives don't come out necessarily knowing how to navigate archival or library systems, which are unique 
weird set of mm -hmm. standards and expectations that are you know, just unique to us that you're not gonna find, let's say if you're searching on Amazon, because Amazon mm -hmm. has their own set of a whole lot more money than all of us mm -hmm. and resources to do developing and testing, but just a different purpose. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think for us, we're looking at a lot more of how can we create guides around a lot of different topics, kind of like old school, guides that you would find, but they're geared more towards the catalog or they're ge geared towards the special, uh, the digital collections. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that you have, okay, so you want to know more about law topic. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, here's you, here's how you start. Rather than a generic, how are you using this tool? Mm -hmm. um, so hook people with what they're actually there for anyway, mm -hmm. and then lead them through the steps that are specific for their search rather than sort of a generic overview and expecting that. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, and I would argue you have both. Well, you yeah, you yeah, definitely yeah. need both. Yeah, so there's a couple. Thank you so much, Ashley. I think this is very <laughs> helpful to everybody. Um, I want to bring up a couple of points that Joy put in the chat. One is the oh, I'm interested in about the Autry Museum, that they've gone through this um, 100 different communities. How did they, Joy, do you know if they reached out to each of those communities um, and, and how they went about it. Yeah, they, um, I mean, they've been working for decades to establish the relationships with the various tribal communities that their collections were representing, but they, uh, and I'm not gonna get the timeline right on this, but several years ago, they committed to building a new space for their collections. And in doing that process, they went through uh, a community informed building design, uh, which then also affected the way that their collections would be accessed. And um, it involved a digitization project and then the implementation of Mooker 2 with the TK labels and um, in that whole process, uh, they've created sort of this tiered level of access and a community review process. And I mean, you can hear in this all the time and that it took, mm -hmm. uh, but from, from the very core of their building design, um, to the creation of a space where tribes can come in to the space and do traditional activities and rituals with the items that are theirs that are just housed within this collection. Mm -hmm. I think that spoke, Helen, to some of what you were saying about thinking differently about how you're thinking about bringing in different cultures to experience your collections. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it means creating a much different space than like a traditional reading room or shelves or mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever it might be. They have, they have a space within that is actually outside mm -hmm. uh, that allows you to do and handle materials that are only appropriate to handle outside. Um, but yeah, they've, they've done a lot of work. Um, Lisa Posis is the one who has led that effort. And she's also engaged a lot with creating a, a handbook to do the SAA, um, uh, that acronym just left my head, uh, but the, the tribal archival access work that SAA did. Oh, uh, Lisa's been working on having, like creating a handbook on, okay, so now you've made this recommendation, but how do you actually implement this Wonderful. in your archival collection? Awesome. So, yeah. Yeah. That that's fabulous. And I'm so, thank you for sharing that because I didn't know that about the Autry um, Museum and kudos to them for going through the extra work. Um, the other thing that you brought up was, you know, talking about um, um, Native American preservation, the article that you posted about, you know, there's been um, damage, there's historic damage to a particular culture and how you, how you remedy that. And that occurs all the time, you know, God forbid that somebody else from your organization um, previously 
ran off with a whole bunch of the group's records or um and so that's this is a very big topic and it is um um something that needs to be addressed in many repositories because of of historical uh, actions that have been taken and I think that there is now um, between NAGPRA, you know, with um, the returning of records and, and well, more artifacts and, and, and uh, other um, items, um, that some of the similar activities can be, there's a lot of, not a lot, there are things that talk about how to rebuild trust. And um, when I've done this talk in um, different scenarios, I actually use the difference of, to show cultural competency. It was, I think it was um, River Rock was several years ago when um, um, you had the helicopters and you had everybody, you know, and all the armed guys with the, with the German shepherds uh, and they're protesting, right? Red, I can't, why, why can't I think about the waterway? Uh, anyway, and then I show what happened in Hawaii and how the, the culturally competent approach to um, dealing with, they had to come and arrest the protesters, you know, but their approach was totally different and it was more of a respectful way. It's like, okay, you're breaking the law, we have to arrest you. So there's different ways of dealing with people. And when you're dealing with historic offenses, you know, that have been, you have to go out of your way to say, okay, this is what we have. We are in possession of these records. We recognize that your culture has not been, has not been credited, or we recognize that we receive them without permissions from certain people. And then lay out, I mean, the thing is, be transparent, you know, um, and that's all you can do. And I know of several people who have gone out to communities and thank you, thank you, Joy, um, have gone out to communities and they've been told by the communities like, no, we don't want to talk to you. We want to talk to you. You know how many of you have come here before and picked our brains and we get nothing? You know, we don't even get acknowledged for what we gave you. And then you go off and write your paper or you go and you take our records and we never see them again, you know? So I would say, look for, acknowledge, and then tell them what your plans are, what you would like to do with these records or things from their collection, from their culture. And then um, even if it's a matter of, we will make copies and give it back to you, you mean, or, or something, or we will put, you know, maybe they don't want a computer in their, their community so that they can access your digital collection. Maybe their bandwidth isn't good enough for it. Maybe they want paper copies, you know, find out what they want and how you can support them if you're not willing to repatriate or that you're not gonna allow that to happen. But tell them what it is that, and say, we recognize the shortcomings in let's say our description of what we hold or we want to be able to um, um, acquire these records from your community. And we understand that previously this had been done. And so this is what we, we propose that do not. Are you okay with that? Would you prefer something else? You know, those kinds of things, because that has happened just too many times, especially with our colonized um, communities and cultures. So I hope that that gives you an idea. And you know, you all have an opportunity because that's what this grant is all about. This is just the introduction. You're all gonna have the opportunity to form cohorts, to, to um, have working groups that have a shared goal. And then I will help advise you on how to go about uh, creating these culturally competent relationships with um, different and, and different methods that can, you can go about doing that. So I have a few minutes to let you, uh, Standing Rock, thank you. Thank you, Anne. Standing Rock, I should show that video next time um, because it's what a difference in cultural, dis what's um, um, destructiveness and then 
cultural competency. So I'm going to go back to share here. Okay, you don't want to see that. Here we go. So although these are um, academic, I'm just going to show these to you quickly so that you get some ideas from them. And so University of Arizona um, went through a great effort to, um, to diversify the organizational climate. Okay, so they realized that this is, and that I would argue that even though you're a state entity, you, you got to look at it um, grounded on a business practice because if you don't meet patron needs, um, you're not as relevant and, and you're not going to have social capital when you need it, and yada, yada, yada. So um, in their case, they uh, established links with organizations. So, you know, we always put things, you know, in academia, we always put things on the chronicle of higher education. We put our job, job ads there. Um, in your case, I'm sure that you have a state um, HR platform that everything has to go up um, the ladder and, and check off the boxes and all this kind of stuff. But um, what I would encourage you is to additionally, if it's not illegal in your state, to let non-traditional venues be uh, a lot, have it posted there so, um, so that you can reach uh, a more diverse base. Of, of who you're going to, who's going to know about the position, and then solicit uh, community input. And so this initiative shows a comprehensive orientation um, programs for organizational board members and open access. So what I would say is that um, if you can, and, and I'll give you an example, although this is in academia, it's in a very small community. And as per usual, they brought in someone from the mainland to be the head of the archives over somebody from the community, rose up, attended that particular university, got her library degree, became an archivist working there, and when she was not selected to be the head archivist, the community went bonkers. Unfortunately, that person, the person from the mainland was in that role for several years, did a lot of damage, hurt feelings and everything. And now it became that he wasn't, um, it, he, he went back and so now she's the top. But the thing is that the community, you don't wanna get to that point where the community, you don't wanna have to go through this hurt get the community's input. What are they um, hoping for? Now, I'm not saying that I recognize the, the limitations that you all have within the state system, but you can get input to draft from the communities to draft your job description. Um, and though if you say, oh, but you know, all archivist positions, this is a template, we have to abide with that. Under the preferred, you can put experience or um, demonstrated knowledge and experience working with diverse communities or this particular community in your um, area. You can put that as a preferred and put it high up as well. So um, oh, you're going this way. Um, so and then as in addition to that, what U of A did is they had um, a workshop series and they um, continue with the dialogue and then awareness of diversity issues. And so a lot of times we have, and I think this happens a lot in bureaucratic um, repositories like yours as well, but is that they're microaggressions because if they were overt, then um, um, someone's gonna file a grievance or something like that. But um, be aware, make, make people comfortable that they can be aware of certain microaggressions going on and how can these be um, addressed. So um, what they, this is for your staff. Um, and then 
also what U of A had done, why can't I forward my, my slides here? Okay, so they were able to integrate the qualifications um, that, that they included in their job descriptions. Um, so I have a real problem when a job description says experience working with diverse communities. And then the applicant says, the organization that I came from has a diverse community base. Okay, well, that's the organization. What was, what did you do? Did you, or I did outreach to this community. Okay, that's great. How did that community take to your outreach? Were you condescending to them? <laughs> I'm using exa um, extremes here. But you know, how is it that were you able to build and then increase description or in increase access from this particular community? Did you have these face-to-face -face, um, and what was the result of these face-to-face -face outreach um, events? Those are the kinds of things that I, I encourage you to seek. And then UNLV, um, you know, so often we uh, only put what is required by law, especially when you're in a bureaucracy. And so, you know, you have to have the EOAA um, statement and so on, but they went further than that. And they, and I bolded the demonstrate, so same thing is that they want candidates that demonstrate um, how they supported DEIA. And this is where I always look for, um, of course they didn't include cultural competence here, but this is where I look for examples of cultural competency. And so this is um, the first required qualification. They put it right up there. And so this is what I always encourage people to think about is that um, I'm working with um, a couple of ar other archivists on where if job ads talk about cultural competency um, skills in their qualifications and what types. And so, you know, this might be difficult for you, but it can be included. So what I want you to consider is just for five minutes, um, we'll break out into dyads. And how do these, these two statements differ? Um, and could they, at your institution, and then how could those be employed by your institution if there's a possibility? So I'm going to, I'm going to stop share and just give you five minutes to talk about it. So let's see now. Can they be pushed out into their dyads right now? Okay. Okay. Okay, well, welcome back. So, um, so what I wanted to know is that how many, and you can do this by a um, raise of hand on your little icon. Um, how many of you have something more than just your EEO slash AA statement in your um, job descriptions? Okay, maybe does any, so everybody here, I can't see everybody on the, oh, there, well, maybe I do, I do see everybody. Okay, um, so pretty much everybody has just your EEO slash AA and you, you put it on your job description and call it a day. Uh, this is uh, Dorothy. In Alabama. Great. What, okay. what does yours say, Dorothy? 
um, uh, I was uh, talking with Molly about this. Um, you know, I've just recently done um, uh, done updates to our job descriptions, which I have been allowed to like write and not had a lot of um, super, like specific requirements um, within it besides like the obvious. But the main uh, the main difference from the last time I did one in 2018 to um, the two postings I did last fall and uh, this spring uh, was just really changing the wording like at the top and just um, since we were advertising for for a collections archivist um, just focusing that we um, were looking for someone um, uh, to the the section is committed to um, describing um, under underrepresented uh, groups, you know, and and linking out to our the our agency's statement of recommitment from June of 2020 to inclusive history and just really, um, you know, any any job applicant just really putting that like in that first paragraph, you know, that like we're committed to to doing this um, type of work. Here's the statement of recommitment. And before you even get into the rest of it and just trying to um, bring that bring that forward. Oh, terrific. Um, yeah. And so, so so did you see a change in your applicants? I'm not sure. I did see a change in applicants. I don't know if it was related to that. I don't know if it's just a broader. Um, I had a lot fewer applicants this go round than I did back in 2018. And I don't know if that is just also in a um, employee's world of like people trying, like having, you know, just that, like, I just don't know if, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in Montgomery, Alabama. We have our own challenge of attracting people, not just to like, to the area. You know, mm -hmm. like there's a its own challenge, um, and I don't know if that just got harder mm -hmm. from 2020 to today. But mm -hmm. but I I like the change that we made at least in that initial description of pointing people back to that statement of recommitment. That a lot of um, a lot of work that needs to be done um, on that, and and just going. Um, uh, using having it there, um, but I don't. I don't think it's the reason that, mm. that I had a, a lot fewer mm. applicants. Well, so. I mean, bravo, we, brava, I should say, because um, you know you already have a challenge, right? Getting people to apply and then adding that. But I would say that that is very significant because it shows that your institution, your state, because you have that that. Um, to fall back to refer to and showing that these are the efforts that you're trying to make. So unless you are on board with us and this is what you want, you want people who are on board with you and see the value in diversifying the archival record, then you don't necessarily want to um, have them <laughs> on your team because you don't need somebody who's going to fight you and be like, well, I don't understand what this is all about. This is more work, you know? So. <laughs> So, I mean, that's, that's wonderful. So I hope that all of you who don't have that will, will consider um, Dorothy's example. Um, and, and there, I'm sure that your state has come up with some kind of statement that Dorothy was able to refer to that you could refer to as well. So I'm going to try, oh, let's, let's get going. Okay, let's go to here. Um, so let's, okay, so um, I just want to give you a couple of resources. So even though this is uh, health-based, I found this one of the more straightforward and, and um, useful plans. So I would say to take a look at this. You can also refer to, um, I believe this is ACRL's um, statement. And so if you want to argue, you know, with your, um, even though it's for academic art libraries, it's a very good one to utilize 
to um, advocate for your why you want to include cultural competency in your in your requirements or um, job description or what have you. And then um, delivery, service delivery. So this is something that is some um, uh, very useful to utilize as well. So we're not gonna do small groups, of course, but um, you have all the resources, you have this, the PowerPoint. Um, I will send you the um, three um, resources that I mentioned earlier today um, regarding the, where is it now? Um, descriptive, you know, I mean, you can all find it. It's a NARA guidance, um, but I'll send that as well. And so, because I think that that's something that you can do relatively um, sooner than later, because I know that changing a, a job description takes a lot of um, steps, but you can utilize these things to start um, employing and advocating for cultural competency skills. So with that, um, please send any feedback that you have to um, Michelle and Ann. And um, okay, I'm going to go back here. And I want to thank you all. And then please, okay, enjoy degree requirements. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's, that's for sure. Um, and ACA, ACA, for the first time in their history, added a new domain of cultural competency. And so this is a result of Rebecca Hankins and myself um, requesting that it be added. And I just got off the task force to create the, um, the um, knowledge base and the readings for that. So I can also send that to all of you as well for those of you who are not a part of ACA. So this is this is the future, I like to think. And so um, all of your efforts will be will be rewarded, I can assure you, sooner rather than later. So with all of that, thank you so very much. Aloha. Thank you.